All right, thank you uh, everyone for uh, being able to uh, attend this talk today. So um, what I'll be discussing is a follow-up to Nelson's talk about um, looking at what's going on in the, um, cons the consumption of halocarotene and rubra in the sense that you aren't what you eat, uh, DNA profiling and what it's told us about the environmental microbial communities in these um, common species that you find in Hawaii, uh, particularly Halocaridina rubra that is found in the Hawaiian Anculine ecosystem. So um, lots of different authors that have contributed to this information over time. And so if we look at the Anculine Hawaiian ecosystem, um, or the Anculine ecosystem in Hawaii and elsewhere, um, what we see is that the, you've got these landlocked bodies of water that are brackish to hypersaline um, in the sense of being 2 to 40 parts per thousand salt. Um, while they have no surface connection to the sea, they fluctuate with the tides. And this is all due to oceanic tidal changes that are occurring underground. So pushing this water up and down through this ecological um, space and time. And so when you look at this in the cross section, what you have is um, you have fresh water that is making its way from the terrestrial environments uh, in the sense of, of rainfall and runoff that is moving toward um, the underground ecosystem. Um, that underground ecosystem is also impacted by the ocean where you've got water uh, infiltrating inland from the sea uh, to the cracks and crevices that make up this type of, of environment. And where the two bodies of water mix, you've got either what we call the epigeal or the hypogeal uh, water system in the sense that the hypogeal is this uh, part of the water system that is perpetually in the dark underground, while the epigeal is areas of the ecosystem that um, get some exposure to the actual atmosphere, um, be it either with, with sunlight uh, coming down, in this case, um, into this pond, uh, where you can see the shrimp that are congregating and feeding on the uh, bacterial algal film that is growing in these habitats. And so um, that's where we've got this, um, this, this uh, interaction going on between the microbial um, um, algal uh, community that is taking advantage of these uh, ecosystems um, interacting not only with the atmosphere and environment but then then also with the organisms that that live in them um, overall you have a lot of uh, these habitats uh, following um, an ecological type of a scenario where they occur in the Hawaiian Islands uh, predominantly on Oahu, Maui, and Hawaii. And uh, a lot of this is because these uh, particular islands um, are either uh, limestone and or basalt in nature. And because of that, um, that ecological context, uh, you have the shorelines that are surrounding the edges of these islands um, interacting with the aquifer system and so allowing water to come up and to um, basically bring these organisms to the, the surface. And um, the main organism that you find in these habitats and which is I'm going to be talking about today is uh, Halocaridina rubra. And so not only is this shrimp um, the most common organism that you find within any of these particular habitats, but also between different habitats. 
Um, these shrimp belong to the family of Peonae, so instead of having pinchers as front appendages, they have a CD used to scrape and um, fan the substrate and pick up food that way. While they're small, so in this case, a, uh, this is a spoon, and a ladle, and you can see that the adults are in there um, with the, uh, the other individuals. They're not only small, but they're also highly phenotypically variable. In this case, you've got a population where you can see that individuals here, in spite of the fact that they came from the same place, uh, they range anywhere from translucent to bright red to in between. And while they uh, can occur in these, um, these anchiline um, ecosystems that come up to the surface, they are predominantly hypogeal in nature. So basically these adult animals um, can live underground and feed on the algal bacterial film that's there. Now given that, um, as you can imagine, there is not one particular type of habitat across its geologic range that um, is characteristic of these organisms. So this is from our recent paper in 2022 uh, that just came out in Limnology and Oceanography. Um, here we have Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island where you're not only looking at the, the geographic uh, outline of each island, but also what the benthic uh, sampling looks like on those different islands. So for places like uh, Oahu, for example, um, while many of the, uh, the environments are very similar around the, the different island, um, they're not identical in the sense that you've got uh, a lot of karst or uh, limestone um, uh, habitats that are making up that particular um, anchorline ecosystem of that island. If you expand upon that, uh, places like uh, Maui uh, or uh, the Big Island, for example, um, when you look at the uh, different samplings uh, across the Big Island of, of Hawaii, for example, uh, what you see is that depending on where you are exactly on the island, uh, the benthic habitat sampling that can occur um, can span anywhere from mud bottom to um, algae to um, cyanobacterial type populations like Nelson mentioned. Um, during his talk earlier. So, if you characterize these types of ecosystems uh, based on a variety of different ecological parameters, what you see is that the properties of anchorline habitats uh, in Hawaii uh, can span a wide range of, of systems. Um, anywhere from um, being on the same island and being a pond versus a cave versus um, a, an other situation to having a benthic sampling or microbial or invasive species scenario where you've got yes or no uh, of, of any of these different parameters when you go from island to island. So the big take home message from this is that um, each Hawaiian anchorline ecosystem, particularly nowadays where um, other organisms have infiltrated these habitats, there's not one particular ecosystem description that describes what these habitats are going through um, because they can span all over the map from being um, benthic um, basalt to uh, limestone, algae versus orange type of crust, um, invasive species, yes or no. So there really isn't any one particular type of scenario that describes these habitats anymore. Now to, to 
try to figure out what's been going on when it comes to um, you know habitat um, selectivity, organismal interactions with those habitats and such. Um, our colleague uh, Justin Haggard, uh, basically as a graduate student, um, decided to set up a big laboratory microchasm experimental um, scenario where he grew algae out on small tiles um, in the lab and then assigned those different tiles to different scenarios and then to e different ecological numbers of relevant shrimp. So in the sense of zero being um, cases where there were no shrimp, up to 25 where you had high amounts of grazing by shrimp that were interacting with these uh, different habitats. So you had uh, this scenario where you had mo multiple different um, randomized situations of number of shrimp versus um, interaction with the habitat. And so you can see here that the, the shrimp are interacting with those different tile and, and um, basically uh, being able to, to um, graze at their own leisure. And what you see is that, um, and it's not surprising, is that you know basically the number of halocaridina grazing um, has an impact on these microbial communities in this case the proxy being used to to measure them in the sense of chlorophyll a concentration so you can see that in this case um, where you had different times of, of sampling from when the experimental was set up to where it was terminated out at around 60 days or so. Um, you have different numbers of shrimp density, anywhere from none to low, medium, or high. High being the highest ecological uh, number of shrimp that we would actually see in the habitat and be able to um, have them sample and, and graze on different environments. And what you can see is that over time, um, where um, any case where you had medium or high levels of shrimp, um, over time, the number of shrimp that were present actually did have a significant impact on the amount of of a uh, standing crop that of, of microbes that were sitting in the environment there. And so when you look at this chlorophyll A uh, concentration um, over time, what you see is that just as Nelson mentioned, you know, it, it is a standard of what you eat. So in cases where the algae or the animals uh, were allowed to feed on green algal mat substrates versus cyanobacterial substrates is that the materials that came out of the shrimp on one end are a reflection of what they did on the consuming side on the beginning end and so in the case of green algal mat substrates or cyanobacterial um, the material that they were allowed to feed on was typical of what you would expect to see in the material that um, were actually coming out of, of the animals in the long run. So um, it is a function of what you eat. You know, what these animals are doing is not surprisingly um, impacted by what their habitat is looking like. So, if we look at the microbial communities that are there, and we can use a variety of different DNA techniques, including bacterial-specific B6 and eukaryotic ISP9, to look at what are some of the microbes that are present in both the prokaryotic and eukaryotic bias uh, ribosomal uh, situations, in those organisms, what we can see is that you know 
you've got these big clusters of, of taxa that or are community type that is typical to, to see in these um, organisms. And what you can see is that uh, what was sampled is often very much uh, a reflection of where the samples came from originally. For example, it doesn't matter if the orange crust uh, microbial communities that were sampled were either from Hawaii or Maui. The fact that they were orange crust made them very distinct and unique compared to out of mud versus environmental guts versus laboratory as well as environmental feces. And so what you can see is that there is a very clear clustering of different community types uh, that were sampled um, depending on where they originally came from um, in the big scheme of things. So for example, um, here we have uh, you know, basically these B6 and B9 um, microorganisms in the case of bacteria and eukaryotes, clearly, sh clearly showing that what was going on for these different habitats were reminiscent of where those samples were originally coming from. So not uh, unexpected uh, very much in that kind of case. So overall, um, Ecologically, the relevant levels of grazing by Hedoparadina rubra alters the epithelium uh, biomass. We saw this with those uh, proximity uh, microbial communities. DNA profiling, either using the B6 or the B9, suggests that grazing alters these environmental community micro um, communities. The alterations either through physical interactions or selective consumption is what is driving a lot of changes in these community um, compositions. And that fecal per, uh, pellets from Haloperidina rubra typically follow and resemble what they were originally being able to be, um, to, to graze upon, either in green algal mats or orange cyanobacterial crust. And so these uh, fecal-associated microbial communities are most likely um, substitute um, or substrate-type grazing by the shrimp themselves. So uh, relatively simple um, microbial communities were what we were seeing from these guts per se is that when you took out the environmental community that was being sampled along the way, um, there wasn't a complex, there was a distinct but not very complex microbial community that you were find, finding within the habitat themselves. And that these habitats, uh, as well as the guts of the shrimps from them, were basically pretty stable across not only space, uh, but also in time, in the sense that wild-type individuals that were kept captive versus what was acquired from the field within a two-year time span still had very significant um, types of, of, of similar populations within them. So while there was all, um, a significant role of grazing that took a shape of the microbial communities in these swine anguli, Communities, um, the same communities apparently have little influence on the microbial uh, gut microbiome of Haloperidina rubra in general. So, with that, again, lots of different uh, people were uh, responsible for helping us to do sampling over the years, and I'll open up for any questions. Thank you. Thank you.